Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Wayward Festival and also to this particularly special event. Um, my name is Emily Utter, and I'm thrilled to be chairing this event today because not only is Rochelle a University of Aberdeen alumna, but she's also a dear friend. Um, we are delighted to have Leslie here with us as well. She'll be providing the BSL interpretation throughout this afternoon's event. Before we get started, I just want to thank Creative Scotland, Aberdeen City Council, and the University of Aberdeen for their generous support and funding of the festival, and for the Word Centre of Creative Writing for bringing us such an incredible program of events this year. I also just want to remind everyone to silence their phones if possible. <laughs> Um, I'll just tell you what the format for this afternoon's event is going to be. So we're going to have a little Q&A about the pharmacist. Um, and then Rochelle is going to read a bit for us. And then we're going to segue to a bit more general questions about her writing journey. Um, and there will be plenty of opportunities for you to ask your burning questions. Because as most of you know, Rochelle was a pharmacist. So she can suggest like ointments, treatments for that. No problem. Uh, but without further ado, <laughs> she's my friend, so I get to embarrass her a bit. <laughs> um, please allow me to introduce Rochelle Atala. She is a Scottish Egyptian novelist, short story writer, and screenplay writer based in Glasgow. Um, her short stories have been published widely in literary anthologies. Notably, her short story, Milk, was highly commended in the 2018 Costa Short Story Award. She's the recipient of a Scottish Book Trust New Writers Award and has just wrapped up her co-editing term for New Writing Scotland. Her first short film screenplay, Trifle, was commissioned by the Scottish Film and Talent Network and has recently completed its festival run. Most recently, Rochelle was selected to develop her first feature-length screenplay with BBC Films as part of the 2021 Young Films Foundation Sky Residency Program. The Pharmacist is Rochelle's debut novel, and since its launch in May has been reviewed to considerable critical and popular acclaim, the Herald called it stunning and, quite rightly so, praised Rochelle's highly original voice. Rochelle's next novel is called Thirsty Animals and will be out in spring next year, but make no mistake, The Pharmacist has plenty of juice yet to be wrung from its pages. So please join me in welcoming Rochelle Atala. So can you start us off talking a little bit about the pharmacist's origin story? Where did the idea for the novel come from? Uh, yes, yes, I can. Oh, I feel like I've told this story like <laughs> so many times. Um, so I, I mean, my background was very much short stories um, and contemporary fiction. And I, in about 2016, was in Berlin with my husband and at the time infant son, and we went to visit a museum and unbeknown to us, the museum included a tour of a community sized uh, nuclear bunker. And it was just so unexpected. And they kind of took us down four flights of stairs, turned a big metal door, and then we stepped into this really bleak environment that was completely preserved from the 80s. Um, and immediately I was just kind of struck by all these huge societal questions. I hadn't had any desire to write about bunkers before. It wasn't like I had a huge amount of knowledge of them. Um, I knew they existed, but yeah, there was something about this space that I stepped into that I couldn't let go of. And so I kind of let it percolate in my mind for a while. Um, and then, it, yeah, it, it started to form into this novel. And well, did you end up then going down like a bit of a wormhole with bunkers <laughs> or, you know, how did that continue to grow <laughs> into what it became in the novel? Yes, but it wasn't a particularly useful wormhole to, to go down. Um, I, I basically kind of went back and tried to write down everything that I could remember about this one particular bunker, because I knew that if I was going to write a fictional bunker, it was very much going to be mirrored on this one, purely because of its sheer scale. Um, but I did then go down lots of yeah, like rabbit holes. Uh, I got several books. It must have been like the weirdest Amazon order, like the day some of these bunker books arrived. Um, and I would spend hours reading them, and I, I would, I think my husband was like, like, what was going on? I'd Did he think you were like preparing yeah. for an apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> I think I have prepper tendencies, yeah. Um, and I would go down, like some of the information was fascinating, like there was one bunker 
uh, in Mid America, which is quite a fancy hotel, but the ballroom is actually a bunker. And so when you're there, you don't realize it's a bunker. Um, and some of the staff that are employed at the, hot at the hotel are also actually like government uh, employee employees. And their job is just to pretend that they work at the hotel, but actually they're there in case all of a sudden, you know, someone important needs to go into a bunker. And I just find that really fascinating. But it was kind of useless for my book, <laughs> knowing that. Um, so yeah, it was also kind of a lesson of what, what, when, when do you draw the line to stop and, and actually just put pen to paper and start writing the story? And uh, did you set out to write a dystopian novel? Like, is that? what you thought this was going to be called at the end of the process or was it part of the process at all um i was always drawn to dystopian fiction because i think they're a really interesting way of looking and questioning big societal problems um i hadn't thought of myself as a dystopian or kind of speculative writer it's a word that everyone keeps throwing at me or the publishing house keeps throwing at me speculative okay um but I, I was just aware that I want, I'm, I'm interested in character. I, I would say I'm a character driven writer and I just wanted to write a story about a particular voice and it happens to be in a bunker, then if that's speculative or dystopian, then great. But I don't, I don't think I approach any of my writing thinking, what is this? I kind of just let it, let it form. Um, so one of the questions that I really wanted to ask was about the food. And I don't know how many of you have actually read the novel yet. And so I hope I'm not spoiling anything, but there are these food pouches. <laughs> like I imagine that must have been like one Google search that went quite far, but um, they're like commodified. They're used in transactional ways at times. Other times they kind of ease tensions between characters, which is really interesting. Um, and they contrast enormously for, you know, with the food that's in ND's lair. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wondered, had you always thought to use the food as that kind of catalyst, that vehicle for those sorts of things? Or was that necessitated by the fact that, you know, there had to be some way to get nutrition in this space? Um, I think it was a mixture of both because I didn't realize at the time, but I love writing about food. I love the, the interaction that we as humans have. And when I look back at even a lot of my short stories, uh, there's a kind of, there's a versatility, I think, around writing around food and how, how we eat, how we treat food. Um, so that probably felt quite natural. But when I was in the bunker that inspired the novel, um, the kitchen there, it was tins of food. Um, and it was whatever you could pack in and kind of hoard as much of. So I knew that I needed it. I wanted it to be something as kind of bleak as that, but not tins. Um, and I would be feeding my child these like Ella's kitchen pouches, which just looked horrendous. Like it was a Bolognese kind of um, pureed. And I just thought, wouldn't that be interesting if you kind of forced everybody to, that was your, your form of nutrition. And then, you know, we do spend, we send, you know, astronauts into space for, or the space station for a long time and they are, they are eating food that is not appealing. So it just felt like quite a kind of natural progression to force, <laughs> to force these pouches like on my inhabitants. Yeah. Um, maybe off the back of that, claustrophobic is, a word that comes up often with the pharmacist, both in its reviews, but also um, in its marketing material. Mm. And, you know, it's obviously because of the characters' close proximity to each other and the sort of underground feeling of the bunker, but it's also very present in the text. Mm. Um, and I know that people have sort of commented online about how there's no quotation marks around your dialogue, but I, I thought that that was such a great way of immersing the reader in that strange closeness. So I just wondered if that was just a happy coincidence or whether that was sort of purposeful in the sense that you really wanted that sort of reading experience. Um, I think the quotation or the lack of quotations is a, a happy accident mm -hmm. that adds to the claustrophobia. Um, all my writing has no quotation marks, which I've realized since becoming a published author is quite controversial, like who knew? Some people really get it, some people absolutely hate it. Um, but I do, I do think it probably does add to the claustrophobia. Um, and when I, when I was writing it, you know, I tried my best to actually imagine that I was in there with Wolf. And so I felt claustrophobic writing it. So I really wanted, 
I mean, I know it probably makes some people feel uncomfortable when they're reading it, but I really wanted that to come across. So, yeah, I would do anything I could to make it as, as claustrophobic. And I think, again, with Wolf's voice, and it's very internal, and you're only getting her perspective, um, that was quite a conscious decision. I felt if, it, if I'd had the bunker portrayed by different people's perspectives, I was worried that the claustrophobia would kind of vanish. So, um, yeah, that was probably quite intentional. Um, I mean, maybe that's a good time to talk a bit about Wolf because she's not particularly likable. <laughs> um, like we root for her. We root for her even when we hate her. Um, how did she come to be who she is? <laughs> this complicated soul called Wolf. Um, I, I, when I found her voice, when I decided that I was going to be the far, the character, the protagonist was going to be a pharmacist. Um, her, her voice just kind of came to me and I think it was a mixture of my own kind of my own profession kind of purging out onto her and um, we're very different characters um, but I also I, I think when you put someone in that environment it's going to be very stressful and when you push someone to their limit I thought it would be an interesting way to explore what they're, what they're capable of um, I, I think flawed characters are really interesting. That's that's what appeals to me as a writer. Um, and so I, I kind of took her as almost like a character study. You know, who is this person and can we keep with her? Can we, you know, can you keep the reader on side and continue to have empathy for this person who I think deep down isn't bad, but certainly doesn't behave the best um, on many occasions. <laughs> yeah. Um... She does sort of two really deplorable things. We'll say two <laughs> deplorable things, sort of in the latter half of the book. Um, but there aren't massive consequences for her. I mean, she's not like thrown into prison or like guillotined or anything like that. And I don't know, in a post-apocalyptic world, you might imagine that punishment would be quite harsh. Um, so she almost escapes like accountability in a way. Yeah. Um, does that speak to who she is as a character or is that just the reality of what life is like in the bunker? Um, I think both. I think in one respect she actually holds quite a lot of power because she is the pharmacist that is in control of all the medicine and therefore has a lot more interactions with other inhabitants than perhaps someone that worked in the laundry um, of the bunker. Um, but I think I also wanted it to feel like when you're in, essentially, you know, the bunker is now a microcosm of society. It's its own little world and there is a hierarchy and structure run by the leader. Um, and I think terrible things are happening, but they're kind of hidden, you know. And so actually, I think if she had become useless to Andy, something could easily have happened to her. Um, but by the end of the novel, it felt quite, you know, he almost needed her more than she needed him. And I think her understanding that power as the novel progressed and by the end realizing the power she held kind of kept her safe, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, in terms of process, maybe while we're just talking about a couple of the other characters, I was really curious about, and I think at one point you say, there is only a need for surnames um, in this place but how did you go about picking <laughs> surnames for all your characters and just I mean they're so well matched to who they end up being so what was that process for you oh I'm glad I'm glad you you think that because um it was something I worried about quite a lot um yeah when someone's only going by their surname um you you do put a lot of weight and value on that um it took me a while wolf's name came very quickly um i think i just thought it was quite a cool name and when i put the voice with it it just seemed to fit so i rolled with that um other names i would have like you know place card names until i found the right one and they would come from everywhere i was in a museum in dublin and i was reading about this really impressive character called glass and i thought that's that's a good surname and so i was just stealing really good <laughs> really good surnames whenever they came along but i i also like there's a character called maxwell in the book and my best friend her surname is maxwell and i i didn't equate the two and then when she started reading it and i mean not a nice thing happens to Maxwell. And she was like, is this some sort of like subconscious? And I, and I, I just, I think I just thought it was a good name, yeah. Um, one of the most amazing things for me about The Pharmacist is this incredible restraint in the text. And I know I've asked you about this before because I'm, I'm a big short story reader 
And I just felt like this is the short story lover's novel <laughs> in so many ways. And I don't know if maybe you know what I mean by that, but do you credit your sort of beginnings in the short story with that approach to narrative? Oh, yeah, ma massively. I mean, I would say that my, the whole foundation of my writing comes from short stories and short story writing. The economy of a piece of short sto a short story um, is always something that's interested, interested me. Um, that kind of idea of you start the story as late as possible and you get out as quick at, as quick at the end. Um, so, yeah, that all that and those foundations of what I loved about short stories I wanted to bring to a novel. I wanted it to be something that had space for the reader. I wanted it to be open to interpretation. Not everything can be tied up, uh, you know, wrapped in a bow. Um, I wanted the reader to come away still thinking about the characters and the world of the bunker. Um, since then, I've realised some people don't like that. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think... I would like to think that if you're a short story lover, you would also see my love for the form um, in the novel. On the topic of restraint, um, with this being sort of marketed as uh, near future, dystopian, speculative, I wonder if you ever felt compelled to like go hard on climate change. Because you don't, you don't. And so I just wondered why, why you made that decision. Um, I think at the time when I was writing it, obviously I, I was very worried and I continue to be very worried about climate change. But when I was writing it, um, my immediate concern was more about Donald Trump <laughs> and kind of the rise of populism and fascism. And so that was kind of the immediate kind of what was keeping me up at night. Um, and even, you know, today you turn on the news and nuclear war feels ever more present yet again. Um, so I kind of just let... I let myself go with with what felt most fearful to me at the time, um, and then obviously having visited a bunker, I, I couldn't see past kind of nuclear war. Even though I don't actually state in the book that it is nuclear war, that was very much for me the undercurrent and what was causing um, them to be in this environment. Having said that, my second novel is all about climate change, so <laughs> I think it was it was back there Can't just wait. waiting. <laughs> it was waiting um, for yeah for book two. Um, to come out. Um, I want to ask about the Christmas tree decorating competition. <laughs> uh, it's quite a specific scene in the novel. Everybody loves um, that. It's so <laughs> strange. Um, but I think we've all been there, you know, where we've been forced into some game that we don't want to play. And actually, that's really what Wolf's almost whole journey, especially with ND, is. Mm. Um, what does, but who does the Christmas tree serve ultimately? in the end, I think, is my question. I think ultimately it probably serves ND. I mean, everything's, I wouldn't say a game, but everything's at his disposal. And it's another way of him exerting his power and control over people. You know, people were, because the world that he's created, you know, you don't want to have any form of um, a revolution. You want to keep everyone an even keel. Um, and that means, you know, reduce any possibility of people having it being able to express themselves or kind of you know, lift their head above the parapet, so to speak. Um, but you do occasionally need these moments of um, something to break up the, the mon mundaneness of the routine. And so I like this idea of acknowledging Christmas, which, um, because I think Christmas is quite a stressful experience <laughs> generally. Um, so I wanted to have something that kind of marked a significant time of the year because most of the time they don't have any bearing of, you know, what the season is, what the month is, what the day is. Um, so I quite like this idea of having something that could potentially be a joyous occasion, but also could turn quite barbaric because it is the bunker and they're all quite brutal. Um, and I think it was, again, that way of exploring we're not very good generally with competition. You know, like people, if you put them in a really competitive situation. Brings out the worst Yeah, uh -huh. um, So I find there was something quite entertaining about exploring that. Um, but yeah, I get asked about the Christmas tree a lot. Like my, it's like my editor's favorite part. <laughs> it's quite barbaric. Maybe yeah. it brings back bad memories. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's one other like quite particular part of the book that I want to touch on. Um, which is the traveling group, mm. the group that meets in the library and sort of travels through sort of books, like travel books. Um, is that a coping mechanism or is that something else closer to like 
disassociation or denial? How do you see those characters and what they're doing? Um, I think depending on the character and how they use it, it's both. Um, so I think for Wolf, it's pure escapism. Um, I think for other members of the bunker, it's become reality to them. They've kind of completely detached themselves from the previous world. Um, when I was writing it, I was aware that the space was very bleak. So, you know, you can't, <laughs> you need to have moments and pockets that feel hopeful again and feel um, something to kind of celebrate and enjoy. So I was very conscious that I needed and wanted Wolf to have those moments and the travel guides, because there is a library, but it's very heavily censored again, because, you know, you shouldn't be reading anything that kind of, qu that makes you question the world that you're living in. Um, but the travel guides felt to me, I mean, I love to, I don't do so much now, but I love to travel. Um, and I think that's kind of when your imagination um, is almost at its best. So I like the idea that Wolf would take these imaginary journeys around and kind of be able to live in a happy space with her memories. Um, but I mean, they're also tinged as well, because when you come out of that reality, when you come out of your little traveling visit, you realize that actually you are still back in a bunker and it makes you think about the people you've left behind. Um, and I thought, I thought there was quite a nice nuance to, to doing something like that. Um, One of the yeah. things that I loved about the first traveling episode is that as the reader, you're kind of like along for the ride going, oh, they've got something, yeah. you know, that, you know, what's it going to be? And then it just turns out to be their imaginations. <laughs> and there's a bit of like, oh, you know, but your I heart think, hurts. <laughs> <laughs> but I think as well, um, because I wrote the book before the pandemic and sold the book, but I was having to edit it during the pandemic. And it kind of reminded of how adaptable we all, all are as well. You know, I think when the initial lockdown came, it was so shocking and so disorientating. And then by the end of it, I want, you know, I remember them changing the rules and saying, oh, you can go out and see your family. And I was like, oh, I, I don't know if I'm ready, you know, to go back. I quite, I was kind of happy in my cocoon. And I, I liked, that felt that, well, like when I went back to edit the scenes of the traveling, there was a kind of familiarity from what we'd lived through ourselves that I felt kind of mirrored that. I mean, I suppose off the back of that question, I should probably ask, like, what, was there anything during lockdown, the pandemic, that actually went into the novel at a later stage? Um, do you know, not very much. Most of it was already there. The only thing is I remember adding in like a sentence about washing hands. <laughs> I feel like that was just quite prominent at the time. Um, I think there is a mother whose son reaches out to her and she says, oh, don't worry, we've washed our hands. Um, but actually, no, very little, um, which is kind of scary. <laughs> um, didn't have to. <laughs> yeah, because I suppose on one level, it could be kind of seen as a pandemic novel. Um, but, but no, I think what helped, not, I didn't want to live through a pandemic, but I think what helped was making me think, well, actually, this seems a lot more relatable to people now. Perhaps if the pandemic hadn't happened, um, maybe people would have questioned the existence more. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I felt it, was, it could easily have happened, but yeah, the pandemic made it probably a bit more relatable. I just want to chat a bit about the ending. Um, and I watched Damien Barr's interview with Maggie O'Farrell during the Edinburgh Book Festival not too long ago. And they had to talk very cryptically about the ending to the marriage <laughs> portrait. So we may do that as well, because I don't want to spoil it for anyone. But um, we can't not talk about it because it's brilliant, at least from another writer's perspective. Um, did you always see the ending as it was? Or were you ever compelled to give Wolf and the other inhabitants of the bunker something more? <laughs> that was very well. Was that cryptic <laughs> enough? <laughs> yeah, very, very good. Um, no, the ending that I wanted, or, or the way the world is left, um, I, I feel like the arc of the story, which is between really Wolf and the leader, N.D., that is completed and that's probably the arc that drives the novel but the wider kind of questions on the world of the bunker are, are I'd left the way I'd imagined when I started the novel this is what I wanted without giving too much away yet yeah, the end is is the end I wanted and no none, nobody in the publisher is going to push back on that they were they were quite happy um, it felt like the natural thing for me to do um, I've since then had people be like, but, but what about, but what about this? And I'm like, well, just have it, just have a think. What do you think? Yeah. Um, and I like that. Again, I think it goes back to it. I, I don't think the writer should be the person that has to explain everything. I think there should be room for, yeah, for your, for and the story. Here we on. are. <laughs> <laughs> Q and A.
<laughs> um, but, uh, but I was saying to Emily in the green room, I did an interview with Damien Barr yesterday, and just before the cameras rolled, he kind of like went to me, I thought this was going to happen at the end. And then like, we, sat, we had to start like rolling. And I was like, I don't know if he likes the book or not. Like, did, he, did he want more from the ending? I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it, it seems to be quite a, a topical thing, the ending. Yeah, I think it's better if it generates discussion. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so will you read a bit for us? Of course. Just tell us, uh, give us a bit of context, I suppose. Read and, and make in one hand. Um, so I'm going to read from... Uh, the first encounter that we see Wolf in the pharmacy. It occurred to me, I've done quite a lot of readings, and it occurred to me that I'd never read a piece with her actually in the pharmacy, which is kind of like her natural habitat. So we'll give it a go. If I can <laughs> sit up with my mic. The pharmacy's opening hours were 9 a.m. till 9 p.m., but I always worked the morning shift until 3 p.m. I had to scan my fingerprint to unlock the door and inside the shop floor resembled something of a retail unit. The shelves were stocked with empty medicine boxes like artifacts from a museum and posters depicting migraines and flu remedies hung from the walls. There was a cardboard cutout of a woman holding a bottle of oil for stretch marks, except no one ever asked me about stretch marks anymore. The image only served to highlight how many things had since become redundant. The whole pharmacy reminded me of the fake dispensaries with their out-of-date tablets we used to practice in at university, offering us an insight into our futures. I reasoned that it was like working for one of the supermarket pharmacies, long hours in a windowless box, and to think I had toyed with the idea of becoming a teacher. The teachers had it worse than me. It was nothing but crowd control in a place with nowhere to go. What education could they offer? What history could they teach, aside from token anecdotes of imperialism? Towards the back of the shop floor stood the dispensary, protected by a door and a perspex partition. I had to scan my fingerprint again to open it before quickly closing and locking myself inside, the same fearful way I used to run and climb into my car at night. Valentine, the other pharmacist, had left the dispensary spotless, as he always did. I opened some of the metal medicine drawers that ra and then ran the tap in the sink, washing my hands. It's lukewarm water. It's, it's lukewarm temperature warming the tips of my fingers. Facing the shop floor and cut out from the perspex was a hatch. Beside it, Valentine had left a stack of plastic measuring cups and paper cones for water. I liked the fact that for most of the time, I didn't have to touch anyone. I had been forced to touch too many strangers in the real world. My heart sang even now when I was asked to step out for a private consultation. There was a calendar in one of the drawers and I flipped through its pages. Each month was a different breed of dog and I paused on one of my favourites, a white and tan Jack Russell Terrier. This calendar was my only means of distinguishing days and seasons, of being able to associate memories with a particular time of year, when conversations about nuclear fallout and isotopic half-lives appeared to be endless, it proved to me that time was indeed passing. Seven months of a supposed 36 in total, to be precise. However, nothing appeared to be set in stone, only the vagueness of being told we were on the right trajectory. To have existed like this for any real length of time seemed ridiculous to me, but here we were, the days scored out in permanent marker. Two plastic chairs had been brought into the dispensary, and I contemplated why Valentine needed two. I sat on one and pulled the other forward to rest my feet on. I was staring at the cut-out figure for stretch marks, convinced the eyes were following me when my first patient arrived, female, possibly early 40s. Her eyes were brown, and there was a few skin tags sitting on the curb of her right cheek. Perhaps I'd served her the day before, but her face brought no recognition. ID and surname, please. The please seemed to roll around my mouth as, as if I was testing it out for the first time. I thought people were so predictable. A dog always looked like its owner. Now the drugs told me everything I needed to know about a person. I was already guessing what she was on before I'd even opened up her drug chart. There was a sullen expression across her face and the eyes continuously shifted. My gut instinct was telling me anxiety and I could feel a smell surfacing as I collected the 40 milligram strength of propranolol from the drawer. It was fluorescent pink, comically cheerful and a smack in the face to her worries. I placed the tablet in a plastic measuring cup and handed it to her through the hatch. She looked down at it. Do you think it makes a difference? 
I shrugged. She took her time, placing a tablet on the back of her tongue, and I stared on, arms crossed. She took a sip of water and made a few heaving noises before eventually swallowing the tablet and opening her mouth for my inspection. I nodded, her eyes fixed on the permanent marker I held in my hand, ready to score off her dose for the day. I wondered then how far she would go to get her hands on a pen or marker. What would she write? Probably her name again and again, a thousand times over. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about your writing journey, generally speaking. Um, but we'll just uh, start with another question about the pharmacist, because we've talked about kind of how that came to be, those moments, you know, finding an agent, meeting the right person, those sorts of things that happen. But what about those moments as an author where you had to make decisions about the narrative? Um, like where to go next and what to do with it, confronting things that weren't working. What were some of those decisions that you made and why were they necessary? With regards to writing the book? Um, oh gosh, where to start <laughs> with that question? Um, I think the main issue I had was when you decide you're going to write an entire novel set in one space and they cannot leave, it's very easy to kind of paint yourself into a corner. Um, so there was a lot of kind of maneuvers that I then had to kind of reverse and try again. And the main issue I had with this novel was um, the ending. I mean, we've obviously talked about the ending can be quite a conversation starter, um, but about finding that right, the right balance. And actually, I think when I started out writing, I was very drawn to this idea of kind of the motherhood strand. Um, and it took me a while to actually realise that that wasn't the main story uh, storyline driving the novel, and it was much more about actually the power between uh, Wolf and ND. Um, I'm not much of a planner when it comes to writing. Uh, normally, I was particularly with short stories, I would just have kind of the seed of a, seed of an idea, and just kind of let it percolate, and then put put pen to paper. Um, and I took the same approach with a novel, which I wouldn't recommend, to be honest, uh, because I think if you plan a little bit more, you probably, it's probably easier to adjust, but I think you have to do whatever works for you. And I, I don't particularly like to plan because I, I worry that I'll then feel like I'm obliged to stick to the plan. Whereas I, I, I think writing for me is working best when you're kind of in the flow and these things happen that you hadn't expected. And you kind of look away and go, wow, that, that, I didn't even know that was in there and now it's on paper. So. That's great, thank you. Um, can you tell us a bit about your writing journey generally? Um, maybe if you had to pick out like a few key moments, moments that brought you here to this point as a writer, what would they be? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, maybe, like, did you ever think that your time as a pharmacist was going to end up being responsible for your first novel? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't grow up wanting to be a writer, thinking that was um, a possibility. Um, I enjoyed books. Uh, I loved film probably more as a child. Um, but I, in Falkirk, which is where I grew up, you know, you didn't go to school and people tell you, oh, why don't you go and be a writer? That just wasn't really a thing. So um, I went off and I did my pharmacy degree. Um, I found it quite a stressful job and there was no creativity in it. Shocking, shocking, I know. There's no creativity in pharmacy. And so, Unless you're Wolf. <laughs> Unless you're Wolf. Um, so it wasn't until I qualified and I'd started practicing that I thought I just wanted some sort of creative outlet. Um, and on a whim, I got a prospectus for um, Glasgow Uni at the time where I, when I lived in Glasgow, we're doing evening classes. So I signed up just for something to do and I would, I would go every Tuesday. And very quickly, I was terrible. I mean, I can't ex express how terrible a writer I was when I started, but I loved it. I was really consumed by the fact that you could work and work to get an emotion onto the onto the page and people could have a reaction to that. That, that was kind of like an addiction <laughs> I found. Um, so that was the catalyst. Um, and then I just decided I wanted to get better and better. And then I moved to Aberdeen in 2012. I'd started to get a couple of short stories published. So at that point I thought maybe, maybe I should think about this a little bit more seriously. Um, and I decided to do um, the M Lit here in creative writing. Um, and Wayne was my, my tutor over there. <laughs> and I spent most of my time working on short stories um, 
under kind of Wayne's supervision. It was brilliant. Um, and then when I finished, I wasn't really sure what to do next. I applied for a Scottish Book Trust New Writers Award and miraculously got it. And I think that, I think for me, it was all one of, one of those things about just like little steps kept adding momentum. Um, I mean, I started writing about 11 years ago. Um, and then it's really frustrating because your first novel comes out and people kind of act like, you know, you just penned a novel and there you go and you're like, I've been grafting, like grafting the art of writing uh, for a long time. Um, so yeah, I think it was all these, like most of what I'd say is just people's encouragement because that keeps you going, you think, because there's so much rejection, <laughs> like so much. Um, maybe we don't talk about rejection enough, but there's so much, so you, you have to have something that kind of makes you continue to go, I'll just keep trying, I'll try and get better and better. Uh, and you want to learn, even now I'm like, what, you know, how can I continue to improve as a writer? Um, so yeah, Scottish Book Trust, and then started, uh, I would still love to finish a short story collection, I haven't got around to it, but I started to chat to a few agents, and it, they kind of made it clear that you should probably try and, and write a novel. And I did try and write a novel, and I couldn't get it published. And in my anger, I started writing The Pharmacist. I was like, fine, I'm going to write something really random. Um, and I, yeah, that's how it all kind of came to be. Um, so you mentioned maybe one there, but I'm an avid listener of Elizabeth Day's podcast, How to Fail. Yeah. <laughs> and so I know that's a big and loaded word, but I wondered if you'd share with us a couple of your rejections, <laughs> rejections <laughs> failures. Um, I mean, I think the, the toughest rejection isn't even the first novel that I wrote because I felt quite determined that I would keep going. The hardest rejection I had was um, I got a, I wrote this novel or the a kind of early draft this very quickly within about nine months I had kind of the draft written and edited and I signed with an agent very quickly and it was an agent that I loved and I can kind of believe it and again it shows you that every, there's a hurdle to everything because I think I thought once I had the agent I was sorted it was all gonna be golden and we um, she sent she was like I don't know if the book's finished like it because it's kind of this odd little book um, but we'll send it to a few people and we'll see what they think. And we got so close to, and we initially we nearly sold it to Penguin and it came back and, and then she kind of was like, I think you need to park it for a while. But I remember like putting my son to bed and like silently crying on the floor <laughs> because I think you're, you're kind of in sniffing distance of this thing that you've worked and really working hard to get. And it, and it, that's how close it comes. You know, even, um, I parked it and I, um, focused on some screenwriting for a couple of years and through screenwriting I realised what I actually wanted to do with the book so I, re I kind of redrafted it after that and then we sold it but even that process you know it goes out to a few editors and you always hear the kind of like uh, the stories of like I'd sold you know someone got a preempt for a million pound and the, those are so like like it's a fairy tale that just doesn't happen for most I love people how like a six figure sum yeah. and you're like <laughs> What is that language? Uh, just say what it is. <laughs> and I, just, I think that just gives a real wrong interpretation of what the publishing industry is like. And a lot of the time, it's just a wing and a prayer. And actually, if the book lands with the right editor at the right time, because it's not even about the, ed like the editor has to like it, but then they also have to take it to an acquisitions meeting and then convince everyone else around the table, the people that are in charge of the, the money, to, to give them some money to put an offer in. So, I remember when we got to proof stage and I was in the hoarder offices chatting and I was a bit like, it does feel like a little bit of a miracle. When you see a book in a shop, it does feel like a little bit of a miracle has happened to, to get it there. Um, but yeah, the first round of rejections was probably <laughs> the most brutal. I don't think I've cried again since then. I think I've kind of, but it's good because I think you ha you're going to have rejections like that and you have to be able to let yourself feel sad for a bit, but then be like, okay, enough, back, back to the desk, back to work, yeah. What is the best piece of writing advice you've ever received? Oh, um, what is the best piece of, I think just to, don't feel like you have to be prescriptive with your writing, just write what you want to write. Um, yeah, and don't worry about it. I think you, you'll you write because you love to write. Obviously, it's great if you then go and get published, but I would still be writing if this book hadn't been published. So I think maybe just make sure that you're writing the things you want to write and that you still love writing. Um, I think it's very easy once you're in the system as well to feel like it's all very prescriptive and 
I mean, writing to deadlines isn't that pleasant. I had to write novel two under a deadline, and I like the novel, but I hated writing it. <laughs> so I, um, I think, yeah, just make sure you remember why you're writing what you're writing. What's the worst piece of writing advice you've ever received? I think I've said this one to you, write every day. I hate that piece of advice. Um, I don't think it serves anyone. Some people, maybe it does, but not for me. Um, because I think you're writing even when you're not physically writing. I think your head, I feel like writers are never off. I feel like we're always, you could go to the shop and something will grab your attention before you know what this world is kind of forming in your head. So yeah, but physically sitting down at a desk, for me, that, that doesn't work. Well, actually, that day. leads into my last question. <laughs> um, so this is your pre-warning to have some questions for your own Q&A. <laughs> um, what does your writing routine look like? And what did you know? What do you know about your practice now that you maybe didn't know five years ago? Um, my writing routine varies day to day. Um, I'll, I can go back to that in a bit more detail, but um, I think what I've taken from what I didn't know five years ago is that you should just write everywhere you can. I think before I was really precious, I was like, it needs to be in a cafe with just a little bit of back noise. And then I had kids and I was like, actually, it just needs to be like wherever, yeah, whenever you can do it. Uh, so I think I've, I've just learned to be less precious about um, where I write and when I write. Um, but yeah, my day varies. Um, I feel like I, I probably get less time to write now. Um, I think I get, there's a lot more Zooms and admin that I never used to have, which are great and they push your projects forward. But sometimes you're like, I just, I just want a day where like, um, and I think those are few and far between now. So again, it's, I have to kind of push myself again and be like, it doesn't matter. Just write, <laughs> just write whenever you can. Um, but yeah, I, it, around the kids mostly is how my schedule works. Um, and sometimes with the kids and I think they get really fed up with, with me, but then, Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to the audience for some questions. Yes, in the front. There's a, actually a mic, there's a mic coming. To you. Hello. I haven't read your book yet, but I'm really looking forward to oh, reading it. Thank you. Um, but I was wondering about your characters, and you talked about not planning do you have did you have a moment when your characters became completely alive and started acting of their own accord or was that moment before you put pen to paper i think I, although i don't plan i must be subconsciously planning in my head because i don't tend to write until i think okay this is this is where i so like for example in chapter one of the novel that's never changed from the original idea that came to me in my head um and I must, I, I think I probably just, I let voices and ideas percolate and then there must be a moment when I'm like, okay, I'm, re I'm ready to, to see what this voice looks like. Wolf's voice is very natural, other voices less so, and I had to kind of go back and, and rework them. Um, novel two, that was, I mean, that's the tricky second album. And I, when I started writing that, I actually ended up changing the entire perspective of whose story because I felt like I was almost just writing Wolf again, you know, just like mm -hmm. a continuation. Um, so yeah, trial and error, but um, but yeah, with Wolf, naturally others less so, and it's a, a lot more graft and research. And I'm a bit lazy, you know. I <laughs> I, uh, I like things to come naturally, and when they don't, I'm like, okay, better. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Got another question? Yes, over in the blue top. It's interesting that you just maybe let slip, Rochelle, that um, <laughs> uh, you know you felt in your, your second novel that to start with you were maybe writing Wolf again. Yeah. Do you think there is more Wolf to come? Is that would you like to revisit her character and see what, where she um, goes next? I don't think in the form of the pharmacist. I don't think there's. I don't have any desire to write any more because I think some people have asked, would there ever be like a sequel to that? Maybe, but that's not something that's on my radar at the moment. I am adapting it for film, so I feel like that's a way for me to kind of continue my love affair with Wolf. Um, but yeah, we'll see. But no, in novel form, I don't. I don't think so. Um, but you never know. She could sneak in. Uh, the short, shopping. short story form. Maybe, yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> Just jumping off the back of saying that 
you're adapting it for film. Will you be writing the screenplay for that? Because as you mentioned, you've done screenwriting in the past. I am, or I'm down to do it. But if I'm no good, I'm sure they'll probably cast me aside and get, <laughs> and get someone else. Um, yes. I, but I, I'm aware of the challenges that will involve. The film that I just finished writing was, wasn't an adaption, so it was, I found like that was much easier to do. Um, with this, it's, it's very much about you know, what's the essence of the book, what's th what do you think is most important and how are you going to show that in film? And it should probably, it should be different because I feel like if you're trying to make a carbon copy of that, it'll never be, it probably won't be as good as, as the book. If, can I say that? I don't know. <laughs> as good as the book, yeah. Um, just what, I think my favourite parts of the book are actually when she's prescribing things to people because <laughs> it feels so real and that, you know, actually that kind of lived experience of being a pharmacist really shines through and I just, but there's a darkness to it that I think is really intriguing and I just wondered if you think there's a dark aspect to being a pharmacist that leads to Wolf's <laughs> choices about how she views people maybe as problems with solutions. And... Uh, I think there could be, yeah, there could definitely be a dark side to pharmacy. Um, I think it's maybe my own kind of dark sense of humour as well. Like I'm quite drawn to, to dark things generally and dark humour. And I tried to, although I was a very professional pharmacist and caused no harm, uh, I think there was probably an element that made me think, but what if, you know, what if, what if you did do this? And what's the, what's the alternative ending? Yeah. I think there's darkness to, to most jobs, I think, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Rochelle. That was great. Uh, I, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned uh, the Emily and it, it took my mind back to some of the stories you were writing then and uh, some of the ones that really stuck in my head dealt with the Egyptian kind of thing, you know, and that you had a lovely, delicate way of balancing up a kind of estrangement with Egyptian culture, but also a kind of underlying Mm -hmm. uh, familiarity and just wondering if, you know, you have any plans or any thoughts about maybe one day taking that further sort of thing. I, th I just think it was such a strong part of what you were able to do with your voice. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, more. there's more short stories that are, are set fully in Egypt or are, you know, inspiration from stories that my dad had passed on to me or even experiences I had when I was in Egypt. Um, obviously, in The Pharmacist, she is half Egyptian, but she, it's almost like she passes, and that's how she's in the bunker in the first place. And I think, for me, with this story, it, it was interesting to look at identity and how people kind of perceive you and how you perceive yourself. Um, and then in the second novel, again, the character is also half Egyptian. It's a very different character to Wolf, um, but there is more about... Um, Egypt as a culture and clash in the second novel. Um, maybe I'm working my way towards something <laughs> fully set in Egypt. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. It's my dad. Um, he's he's not a natural storyteller, but he'll occasionally come out with this amazing little nugget, and I'm like, can I can I use that? And he's like, oh, maybe. Um, so yeah, yeah, we'll see. Okay. Hi, thanks for your talk. It's Hi. lovely to hear. I wanted to, without creating a flashback to a tutorial for you, <laughs> to ask a, a slightly writerly question about this idea of writing within a closed universe. I haven't read the novel, I've, I've just bought it, but this concept of writing from within a parameter that's very, very strictly set, yeah. which both creates for the writer, I think, the necessity for a lot of creation and creativity but also sets up a limitation, a strict limitation mm. as to what you can do. It helps you, I think, because you don't have to worry about getting to the next city or what happens mm -hmm. next Tuesday or going to work, but at the same time, it limits what you can do. And I wondered if that, you mentioned it earlier, but I, I wondered if you could talk about it again, if you think it's a good idea to set work within a limited, closed universe. Uh, I think it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah, yeah I think there's, <laughs> there's pros and cons. Um, I was really interested in the idea of can you engage people with in one space? You know, can, or can you even prolong a story for ninety five thousand words where they do not leave this one environment? Um, and I, I think it made me really think that like, what's the most imaginative, imaginative way to portray these characters and and what they do within this space? Um, 
when I moved on to Nov 2, it was very liberating in the sense that I'm like, oh, they can go to the shop, they yes. can go to a city. Um, but what I find quite interesting is I don't, I actually find writing movements in novels kind of boring. <laughs> so I find myself being like, what's well, the most interesting way to say that they are now in a new space without having to say, and then they go to the kitchen and then they go to the, the pub. Um, so I, I think I've taken from both. And I, I think you're going you're gonna to be writing a certain type of novel, obviously, if, you, if they cannot leave, <laughs> if they can't leave the space. Um, but yeah, I, I came away being like, that was, for me, it was an interesting experience to write. Um, I'm glad that I did it. And again, I think it was just purely dictated by the fact that I'd visited a space that that I mirrored the bunker on and I, I couldn't help but think, what would this be like to sure, live in? Yeah. yeah, and I needed to kind of go down that rabbit hole and see what that would feel like. Yeah, it can, it can be a great challenge for a writer to, yeah. to have it was, Yeah, it was fun. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I think we had one more question down here in the front. Well, not one more, but another one. Hello again. <laughs> you mentioned that your first novel wasn't the one, wasn't this one. Have you got plans to go back and revisit it? Uh, I don't think in novel form. I think there are elements I'm going to take that are actually short stories. Mm -hmm. I think on reflection, I was almost trying to write short stories as if it was a novel. Um, and the main thing I got back from like agents that were looking at it, they were like, oh, the, write the writing's lovely, but we're just not that engaged. <laughs> and now when I look back with a bit of distance, I'm like, I just don't maybe think it was that interesting. Like I think it was beautifully, beautifully, that's bold, uh, nicely constructed, but not perhaps engaging the way it needed to be to, to, for a novel to carry. Um, but there are elements that now I think are so clearly short stories. So I think they'll b become part of the collection that I may, never, I may never end up finishing. But I don't think I'll, I don't think I'd return to it as a novel. But no writing's ever wasted. Exactly, exactly. I've got another question in the front here. This is probably going to be our last one. <laughs> Hi, amazing talk, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, so you were talking about the constraints of the world and the parameters of only having um, the small space to operate within. Um, I was thinking along those lines and have you ever considered adapting your work in, into a stage play due to that constrained space or would that not work? Oh, I've never, I've never thought about that. I, that's probably the least experience I have is in stage. I am... Um, I did have a short story called Pigeon that got adapted for a short play um, and I wrote that and it, it was interesting because I, 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 it was a really rewarding experience and I had to work with a dramaturg but I found it quite hard and I really, really saw the value of what the director did. Like before that I was a bit like, oh, how hard can it be? And then, <laughs> and then I saw what the director had to do. Um, and I, I, I did enjoy the experience, but it, I don't think it's a form that I kind of naturally gravitate towards. Um, maybe because I'm more of a lover of film as well. Um, that that's if I'm going to adapt, that feels to me like the natural place for me to put my attention. But you never say never. You never know. No one's ever asked me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of today's event. Um, thank you so much, Rochelle. That was awesome. <laughs> You're so generous with your explanation about the writing process, especially. Um, Rochelle will be upstairs for drinks and nibbles because this is a book launch, but also to sign copies of the book if you have yours with you. If you don't have one yet, they're available to purchase at the table at the back. Um, and I'm sure if you have any other questions, she'd be happy to answer them. Um, we just want to quickly thank the media services team for ensuring all the technical aspects of today's event have gone off without a hitch and the wider festival uh, team, including all the staff and students for keeping us right and keeping the program running so smoothly. And huge thanks to Leslie here for providing the BSL interpretation for today. Applause. Oh, and thank you to you. <laughs> 
Um, and last but not least, thanks to all of you for coming today and supporting the festival. Um, everything is free, which is so awesome, but we definitely need bums and seats. So um, hope you enjoyed yourself as much as I have. Hope to see you over the next remaining days of the festival. You can follow the festival on social media at waywordabdn. And let's have one last round of applause for Rochelle. Thank you so much. Thank you.